Welcome to another episode of the Regenerative Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Max Gulhane. In this episode, I sit down with repeat guest and good friend, farmer Jake Walkie. On his regenerative farm down in Albury, New South Wales, Jake is building a highly robust herd of cattle uh, with the goal of minimal human inputs into the whole process. To this end, he's using a breed of cattle known as Nguni. And Nguni are an African breed that evolved in the bushlands of Southern Africa on some pretty marginal country, dodging predators, and they're well known and, and praised prized for their uh, high fertility and easy calving. So we, I previously talked about uh, Ngunis with the farm with Brian Usher. So if you're interested, check out that episode as well. Jake and I go deep into the attributes of this amazing uh, breed, and you can't help but feeling excited about uh, learning more and, I guess, tasting some of this amazing beef. Uh, additionally, we touch on an event that's happening at the Walkie Farm in the, on the 11th and 12th of February which is the inaugural Australian Beef Initiative Summit. The Beef Initiative is a, a movement that is promoting uh, food sovereignty and a connection between people and their farmers with the goal of education and helping people connect with the source of their food. I will be speaking on the topic of metabolic health and uh, regenerative farming, and so will Dr. Pran Loganathan. So if you're interested, check out the links in the show notes below. Uh, on to the show now. Okay, welcome to another episode of the Regenerative Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Max Golhane, and today I'm sitting down with a repeat guest, regenerative farmer Jake Wolke. Jake, thanks for coming on. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Great. So today what I want to talk about specifically is the breed of cattle that you are running on your property, and it's a breed of cattle called Nguni. They're an African breed, and we've talked about them very briefly on our first episode. I did an, another episode with uh, regenerative farmer Brian Usher on on the same topic, but this breed is so interesting and so compelling that I really wanted to dedicate a whole episode to it. So, Jake, um, give us a bit of an idea about Ngunis, how you found them, and what about them makes you so excited. Something really interesting about the Nguni cattle is I've been to Africa twice doing my missions work with my local church and people talk about once you've been to Africa there's this innate uh, pull back to the continent when you leave it, it, it's it's I've been to over 50 countries around the world most continents and nowhere I don't have any family connection to Africa or anything like that but there's this pull that I'm um, always feeling like I'm drawn back to that space and I'm trying to draw a parallel because on our farm for the first few years of doing our direct-to-market beef operation, we'd run the economics on our land holding and environment and the market, and we decided that we we're going to be sockers. So we'd buy yearlings, so steers around a year old, we'd fatten them for six or eight months, and then we'd process them and sell them. And because that's the sort of market we've, we're involved in, I've had all the different breeds on the farm. We've had Angus and Hereford and Charolais and Lowline and, and Semental and Red Angus, everything you can think of. They're all great animals and, and all, uh, you know, some have good temperaments, some have bad. They're just like individuals in that case. But none of them I really would stand next to in the pasture and think, you know, these things are special. I don't know if I've drunk the Kool-Aid or something, but the Nguni just have, from the moment I met my first Nguni and I've been... Um, around Australia, visiting different Nguni farms now, there is just this magical uh, compatibility and draw to the breed. And I know this is a little bit hooroo guru, but sometimes uh, above all, you have to follow your gut and your instincts. And I, I wonder whether there's some, I don't know, like like primal draw to know that this animal is fit for the purpose that we're doing. So the market shifted, to get further into your question about why we chose it, the market shifted a while ago and a yearling steer that we used to buy for $800 became over $2,000 and the economics of us fattening that animal to sell it um, was destroyed. You know, we can produce a calf cheaper than $800. So 
uh, the, the draw of buying them previously was that they were already a year old. So we, we figured we're about $500 better off. But now that they're over $2,000, that's no longer the case. So I wanted to find something to breed on the farm. And I'm really interested in valuating, you know, uh, on top of everything else, because on a small land holding, when you're going direct to consumer, every dollar matters. And stacking those value hierarchies is a, is a really big opportunity. So I wanted something colorful on the farm and I ended up buying about 30 short horn cows because they're good quality meat, nice temperament animals, and they're pretty. And I thought I could sell their hides. Uh, but I had them for a while on the farm and I was not impressed with the specific cows that I got in terms of their, uh, mothering ability. And we, we had a pretty challenging season and a few of the, the calves were doughy. I described them as doughy. They weren't getting up off the ground quick and they were getting, uh, pink eye and just different things on the farm. And then you actually went to the local farmers market up at your up at your area and spoke to Bryant, and it was about almost a year ago now. Because when you told me about it, I googled it. It's exa- the Inguni on the headline read exactly what I wanted: small framed, uh, parasite resistant, disease resistant, drought tolerant. I'm like, this is me. And guess what? They come in eighty colours and patterns. So I called a called a breeder who's uh, expat from South Africa come back to Australia, uh, Edwin Roos. He's got hen ham and goonie. And I bought my first bull off him the next day. I just couldn't hold my excitement in. And we're actually carving down those animals on the farm right now. So we've had four of our uh, first and goonie first crosses. So they've, I've, I've bred them with short horns and jerseys, which I'm sure we'll get into why I've done that. And I'll tell you what, the contrast of my last carving of these purebred short horns and then this carving, which has still been the same challenging season really, is we can't even catch these Nguni calves to tag them, put a tag in their ear to identify who they are and who their mum is. And I'm talking about calves that are four or five hours old. They are so sprightly. They're little spring box. And I've told this to Edwin and a couple of the African gentlemen that I know that are in Nguni, and they all laugh at me. and They go, of course, Jake. They're from Africa. You know, we've got lions. They have to run fast. Uh, Unbelievable. Yeah, I'm I'm passionate about the breed, and I I think that there's such a value proposition with the animal, and it's a shame that this Western mindset in Australia uh, rags them. All the reasons I love them, the industry doesn't, and I'm sure that we'll get into the nitty-gritty of that, but it's a a shame. There's a lot to offer here. Yeah, and uh, it is a new breed in Australia, and... Bryant, who I talked to earlier, had himself only discovered them, I I believe, several years prior from another breeder up in in central Queensland. Let's give the listener a bit of an idea about the history of the breed in Goonie, because as you mentioned, it's an and I said it's an African breed, and the name in Goonie is is actually related to the tribe people who who uh, hold and have raised these cattle. So, give us a bit of an idea about the history of the, the the cows in Africa. Yeah, sure. So I'm no authority, and I've been in it a short amount of time myself. But like you said, there's a there's a uh, native peoples called the Nguni peoples, and then you've also got uh, cattle and sheep that are attributed to them. So these people have stewarded these animals for thousands of years. And if you think about the context, uh, Africa is not all desert. Like people have this mindset that Africa's uh, desert, but Africa has arid zones. It's got, um, you know, jungle and forest zones, and it's also got very cold areas. And where these animals uh, have been stewarded for, you know, thousands of years in South Africa is prone to very dry, brittle conditions, but also very high altitude cold conditions, which when we're looking at where we're farming here in Australia, you know, we go, the coldest cold I receive on my farm is about a minus three degrees Celsius. But then the hottest that I've ever checked was a 48 degrees Celsius, which is, you know, halfway to blood boiling, it's, it's really uncomfortable. So I look at the animal as being, uh, I, I, I love that where it's come from, sort of suits the ex- extremities of our climate here. But if you think about the context of a tribal people uh, working in nature with an animal that they've domesticated, they don't have Western farms uh, mindsets and pharmaceuticals to prop these animals up along their journey. So it really is a marriage between the desires of the tribes people so that they'll be selecting for things like you know temperament and and but it's also nature pushing back and not letting you forget about 
disease resistance and mothering ability and defense against predators. And so with, with the Western mindset, uh, which I love, but in this context where we're so quick to give animals a crutch and, and because their value is so high and we don't want anything to suffer. So it comes from the right heart, the mindset's the right to, to help the animal, but you end up with animals that are extremely reliant on inputs all the time. So the fact that these Nguni tribes people have fostered these animals the way they have, I think, is one of the reasons that makes them so powerful. Something else that's cool about the history that I've been reading recently, I've picked up a couple Nguni books. Fantastic. I've been, I've been shopping online and I've subscribed to the Nguni Journal from the Breeding Association in, in South Africa there. Great. But the, 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 there was rules in the tribes, I'm not sure if these still stand, that certain... Uh, if you had a calf a certain colour, you had to give it to the leader of the tribe, uh, and they and they're attributing this to the vast genetic pool of the eighty different colours. Because if you if every red calf you had to give to the king, it was in your interest to make sure that you had lots of different colours, except red in your herd, and that sort of um, throughout there. So there's lots of these little cool tribal stories behind the breed that I think's exciting and interesting. Yeah, I mean you can just imagine what the needs were of those people. They would be primitive, uh, nomadic, herder-type people whose entire Absolutely. livelihood and survival would be depending on the health and the robustness of their cattle. And, you know, there's many tribes in Africa that also uh, are dependent on, on cattle. So, I mean, it's, it's something that is, I think, deeply uh, ancestrally uh, related to human evolution, which is... Uh, perhaps after we hunted out the megafauna, we found a way of domesticating uh, cows in order to provide this key human source of nutrients for ourselves. So you you can just imagine in a in the same way a uh, a tradie relies on his tools and his ute. You have um, these these people, these tribal people, having their whole life and their whole survival tied up, kind of symbiotically with the cow and with the, the, the herd. So they are going to be doing absolutely everything they can with what they've got, which doesn't include drenches, which doesn't include um, veterinary services, Western veterinary services. Um, and they're doing all they can to, to foster the, the health of this breed. So as you mentioned, Jake, we've got a, a, a breed that are basically adapted to a wild environment. They have to put up with these extremes of the African climate. They have to put up with marginal grazing, they, they, they don't necessarily have a, a beautiful, you know, uh, green field every single day to, 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 to graze on, and they have to put up with with predators. So what you have is it is as you said is a breed that is highly fit for purpose. Um, so we we touched on it a little bit last episode, but give us an idea about exactly what you mean by that and how how does that kind of make your job as a farmer easier? Well, the first tenants on our farm. And, and the first value hierarchy that we uh, re reference when do doing decision making on the property is animal welfare. And animal welfare is, for me, it's not letting your dog sleep on the bed. Like that's one interpretation. You know, people want to give their dogs. They go to the they go to the pet shop and they buy them these synthetic green toothbrush shaped blueberry flavored dental sticks, and they've got little Tito on the ground eating this plastic to clean its teeth. Well, the dog wants a bone, right? Like we've complicated this uh, beyond imagination. And welfare for me, you, you first have to look at the the context of what the animal is. So it, it's a chicken. It's a bird. If the chicken's a bird. It doesn't need to be in a cage. It needs to be outside. Like we've just got it so backwards straight up. The, the industrial industry pushes back and goes by locking our birds in cages, we can prevent the import of, disease from wild birds getting to our chickens and for me it's just such a uh it's a it's a shame that we're even at that like what why have we bred a bird that's so immunodeficient that it can't socialize with other birds in the natural setting that a bird's meant to be so for me taking these ingunis onto our farm where they're able to um thrive on lower quality feed like we're we're in a we're in a very green lush part of australia but we still have almost five months a year where the farm's completely dried off and all the, all the feed's gone brown. So, you know, it normally starts around November and we, we mightn't start greening up again till Easter in April. And that's a 
that's a low quality feed that animals sort of just survive on normally. Wouldn't it be beautiful if we had an animal that could take that low quality feed and thrive on it? And one of the amazing things that makes Nguni incredibly fit for purpose is that they've got a higher blood urea. So if you get into f- farming cattle, especially in northern climates, you'll you'll hear and you'll research that it's it's well known farmers put out urea uh, supplements for their cattle to ingest, which high, heightens the urea in their system, which makes them uh, more efficient at breaking down these rank dry feeds and extracting sugars and carbohydrates to replenish their nutrition and 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 survive in that. So that's an input that we figured out is important. But nature's given us an animal that has it built in. It's got a built in urea leak. It doesn't cost anything. And instead of actually just surviving in those situations, they thrive in it. To give people a bit of an idea what that looks like in their head, uh, roughly speaking, the urea level of a cow if, if we use that as a benchmark, the sheep have a little bit more in their system and you can you can imagine sheep grazing a little bit differently to cattle. And then you've got goats a bit more than that again and all of a sudden you're thinking about these animals that are eating blackberries and brambles and the bark off a tree. So we've gone in a couple of species, we've gone quickly from the mindset of lush green grass to eating bark off a tree and then you've actually got camels above that and every photo you've ever seen of a camel, they're in the desert, these big fat humped animals in the desert with hundreds of kilometers of sand around them, but they're thriving. That animal's fit for purpose for a desert. And the Nguni uh, blood urea is almost equivalent to a goat. And so there's so much potential in our uh, ecosystems to you know, harness what these animals have given us in terms of their ability to thrive. And, and so for me, for me I've got to, I'm in a lush area with plenty of water, 800 millimeters of water a year, but it's still dry five, five months of the year. So instead of having to go out there and supplementary feed my animals you know for me welfare isn't me sending staff on a 45 degree day into the paddock to take hay that we bought from somebody around the corner that's had to use um, pesticides and herbicides and synthetic fertilizers to grow and then truck it to my place to feed the animal so they can just get by welfare would be finding an animal fit for purpose to thrive in that environment and and work with them you know be co-laborers in this land healing ministry, like Joel Salatin says, that's one of my favorite comments, and actually uh, toil together to, to to a result that suits everybody's needs. Yeah, um, I mean, that's amazing. And the fact that they can get by or thrive and put weight on on in land or in country and feed that other cattle would unable to be to do that is, I mean, it's astounding and it's it speaks to the, the robustness of, of the breed. The other really, really interesting point that uh, or attribute that the Nguni cattle have is tick resistance. And this was a reason why they've been used up in central Queensland and, and up here in, uh, in Queensland um, so effectively is because they were able to be run in more of this damp uh, kind of coastal uh, grazing land without needing tick treatment. So give us a little bit of an idea about what makes the Nguni so tick resistant. So the Nguni hide, their skin is is just a little bit of a different skin because of the, all the reasons we've talked about, the way it's been um, stewarded in, in its environment over thousands of years. It's a thin-hided animal, which helps it uh, dispel heat quicker, so it's better in, in hot climates. But it also, something interestingly, is it's got three hair... Uh, follicle or uh, three three hairs coming out of per hair follicle so it's, it's also got a very thick hide thick skin uh, thick haired hide rather that makes it hard for the ticks to actually get onto the skin because they don't grab onto hair and suck on hair they hide in hair but if they can't penetrate to the skin it makes it more challenging to them and for, as a double up that makes extremely high quality hides for the for the farmer and the consumer to delight in which is fantastic but something else the Nguni does, which I've only spoken to people about, I don't have a tick, there's no tick issue where I am, that we're not humid enough, but they excrete an oil that uh, interrupts the development of the tick and, and I don't know whether it sterilizes them or interrupts their growth patterns, but it basically makes the Nguni unpalatable. It's a natural drench. You've got a, you, So we've got a built-in urea block and we've got a built-in drench so far. You know, how many more uh, things can we build into this transformer of a cow? Incredible. Uh, and, and it ex- expels them. And something else really cool, you know, I I get a little bit of flack because I've got cows with horns now. So in, ca- in goonies have quite 
uh, serious cool horns. Let me let me reference this photo again. Look at this bull. Isn't he cool? Oh, he big horns. Yeah. Now horns. I, I think there's a there's a range of reasons why we've gone away from horns in agriculture. And the obvious one is, and I don't necessarily think it's the main one, but the obvious one is farmer safety, rancher safety. You know, nobody wants to get speed in the guts. And, and, and I've heard a few horror stories. Interestingly, I've heard more horror stories of being, of people being kicked by cattle and horses or um, squashed against the side of a panel than I have with horns. But that's also a bit of a false contrast because not many people have horns that they're contending with. So it's hard to sort of know where that sits. But nobody wants to get hurt by these horns. I think the real reason we've selected animal away from horns is when you're jamming 40 in the truck to go to the market, they can cut each other up. Now, this is another one of these welfare uh, misdemeanors. It's it's reality, but I, I, I don't think it, it's, for me, in my context and the way I want to do things, it's not a paradigm I'm willing to work within. If you need to cut the horns off an animal, which we still do in agriculture, or breed the horns off an animal, which is fine, that's a less barbaric way of cutting them off. If you need to do that purely because when you put them on a truck, they bruise each other's meat, and then once you process it at the abattoir, you've got lower quality meat. Um, you know, there's, there's other ways to skin a cat. And for, I know this isn't going to be for everybody, and this is a bit idealist, but for me, I want to build an abattoir on my farm, and the animals can just walk from the paddock into the abattoir and just circumnavigate the truck. Like that just sounds like such a better workaround uh, to me. And when we're, when we're removing the horns for these farmer safety and animal safety, are there any other attributes or skills that we're taking away from these animals? Yeah. And to get to your comment about the ticks, when I was at Edwin's farm picking up my last couple of purebred and goonie cows, which there's less than 250 units of purebred and goonie cow in Australia, there's thousands and thousands of first crosses, second crosses, that sort of thing, but there's not very many purebred cows. So I'm very happy to have, I've got uh, three purebred bulls and two purebred cows on the farm right now with calves at foot, which is fun. But one of the cows lifted up her hind leg, so her back leg, and with the horn on her head, she's reached underneath and scratched underneath her teats, underneath her udder. Mm. Now, this is enormous. This is a high value area for a tick to grab onto because of the, um, the, the there's no it's not really thickly covered in hair you know it's bare skin it's low to the ground so the ticks can crawl up the plants or if the cow walks through water and they can grab on it and it's hard for a cow to to scratch the under of its udder on a tree which is what they might do on their back to get rid of a tick and to just stand there and watch the animal use this uh, tool to potentially. Uh, combat parasites was just so exciting for me it was a real it was just another one of those one percent light bulb moments and then there's other things there's data out there that horns make uh help animals forage harder so in goonie browse quite a lot they they get into shrubs and bushes and the horns can help them push into those rough places to sort the leaves and uh and they can, there's also data out there that the way the blood flow throws through the horns, it can help them regulate body temperature in extreme heats. So I'm not a massive horn. I'm not a full-blown horn advocate. I know I sound like it. But in Goonie, there are polled genetics as well, which I'm uh, researching at the moment. Polled means that they've been bred to be hornless. Uh, and, and I think there's a place for that in the market. But for, for our context, I just think you've got this uh, God-given tool. And rather than cutting it off, for the for the sake of saving the bruising of the flesh, you know, there's a real opportunity to work in harmony with the animal, for and and, and let it, you know, maybe keeping that horn on the animal just gives it that little bit of extra edge in fighting the parasites in the paddy. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that is an amazing point, and what it speaks to is unintentional consequences of selecting or or putting breeding the breed in a certain way. So every time you select for one trait, which might be absence of horns, you're compromising in a way that you might not know. There's unintended consequences. And nature has provided or provided the, the animal with a certain set of features for a certain set of reasons, which might be unclear or opaque to us as humans. And you know, science and medicine is filled with examples of what is called epistemic arrogance, um, as Nassim Taleb would, would, would call it, which is basically humans 
not understanding what they don't know and making these decisions with an arrogance that they understand the whole system and it's a complex system and in truth they don't and they're essentially making trade-offs that that have consequences and ha- have costs so the, the example of the cow with the horn um yeah look she had the horn because perhaps it's it prevents her from from becoming tick tick and bitten on the udder and that again was probably increasing her fitness the fact that she she has horns to the point about uh, why you would dehorn um, related to possibly spoiling of meat, again, you can solve that problem uh, by on-site processing. And it's something that, that we're going to talk about a little bit later with the Beef Initiative event. But we we believe that bringing the whole production process on on-house, on-site, and doing everything locally is the best way forward um, for us and for, for, for the cow. So um, I, I want you to speak a little bit about the history of Nguni in Australia because, as you mentioned, there's only 250 purebred animals. How did this African breed get to Australia and, and where are the, most of the, the majority of these animals located? Yeah, sure. The, basically, the reason they're coming here is you've got uh, generational South African farmers that with the current uh, economic and political climate there, they're, they're basically fleeing South Africa and to, to search for uh, places around the world where, where their families are safe and they can farm and earn a living and go to school and just live the lives that, you know, here in Australia, we're, we're so blessed to have. Uh, but these people love their lifestyle and love their animals. And I've been really impressed watching the, uh, I, I guess, unity from these South African farmers that I've met. Uh, I've spoken to a few online. I've met quite a few in person now, and there, there, there seems to be a real uniformity and unity around their uh, husbandry and animal knowledge and land management that we that we just don't seem to have. I haven't quite found it the same here in Australia. But essentially, when they're selling up their, fa- their, their family farms and getting out of the country, they're taking uh, eggs and sperm out of their cattle. And this is a really great example of technology just being wonderful uh, b- because i'm such a i guess holistic based wanting to do everything organic and naturally and not rely on technology for everything uh, i I'd, I'd love to point out that you know we're not anti technology and i think this is one of the best uh examples of that they've 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 harvested sperm out of a bull you can imagine how they do that and then you can flush eggs out of a cow so your cow ovulates and the vet comes in and they, they can flush the eggs out and, and freeze them down. And you can get six to eight or so every ovulation out of a good quality cow. And then when they import those genetics to Australia, if you put that sperm in a donor cow, you're going to have a first cross. So if you, if you took an Nguni bull and put his sperm in an Angus cow, the, the baby's going to be a first cross Nguni Angus. But you can take that sperm and egg and the vet can marry them up in the laboratory and make an embryo. And then you can put that embryo in a donor cow. And then you can have that Angus cow give birth to a purebred and goonie animal, uh, which is exactly what's happened. They've, they've brought in genetics. And essentially, if you think about the farmers that I've worked with, they may have been farming in goonie in Africa for 50 years. And all they've done is just skip. They've, they've, they've left their herd, which might have cows in it from, you know, zero to 15 years old. And they've just started the next generation again. And yep. they've probably even had a bit of fun with it in terms of selecting exactly which bull and which cow and, and mixing it all up in the process. So that's how the breeds got going here in Australia. And there's a lot of farmers using uh, bulls on other breeds to get volume of watered down and goonie genetics on the ground really quick because yep. obviously that embryo implant is expensive and time consuming and doesn't always grab. You know, there's a failure rate associated with that. Yeah, I mean, essentially, for the analogy to human health is is having a surrogate, um, a surrogate mother, yes. so that you have a, a couple who who shared their their um, uh, germ cells and made a, a zygote, but sim- simply implanting that into uh, a third person, into a, a a different female for gestation of, of the pregnancy. Yes. So, I mean, what an what an amazing way to, I guess, import. The, the cattle breed across the water and into Australia without actually physically bringing the, the animals across. So, I mean, that's that's uh, 
it's a, it's a it's so cool. incredibly ingenious way of um of doing it. So and at the moment, mm. some of the farmers I'm I'm dealing with here in Australia, like on Twitter, I'm getting all these people inboxing me going, "There's no inguni here in North America. Where do we get genetics?" And some of the farmers that are doing inguni in Australia have just finished successfully quarantining inguni bulls to extract semen for USA export and the sperm's on the way and people are going to be able to access those genetics and start to get their crosses on the ground. And I've been making a few of those connections. It's just great to to see the uptake around the place. Yeah. I, I want to talk about your approach with crossing um, in term as you mentioned, we, you, there, there are ways of, I guess, amplifying or building your herd very quickly. But before we talk about that, I want you to address a couple of the detracting points that people might have, particularly in conventional or or mainstream agriculture um, about Nguni. Now, I've talked to a couple of people about the breed and, you know, the first one and the, the most common one is that, oh, yeah, you, the meat will taste bad. And I'm going to debunk that first because I've spent the past uh, over 12 months eating uh, in, in Nguni um, from Br- Bryant Usher's farm, Eastwell Farms, and I will say that the quality of the meat is 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 amazing and the depth of flavor the the amount of fat which is not necessarily marbled it's not intramuscular fat um which in an in, in analogy to human health it's not necessarily like a diabetic animal this is a very healthy animal but the flavor uh, of all the cuts has been absolutely tremendous and the tenderness so so i mean let's put that one aside and jake you can you can obviously tell us that there are many factors that go into the taste of of the animal, but in in this case, from the one farm that I've been eating regenerative inguni, there's been absolutely no concern about um, the quality of of the meat. The other main concern that uh, that was been raised, or one farmer has raised to me, is that why would I use inguni when I can just use brahmin? I mean, it's just a smaller brahmin. So, Jake, what what would you say to that? Well, the, the Brahmin thing's interesting. When I went up to Mount Pleasant, which is in the Northern Territory for the inaugural Nguni Information Day, I was talking to ranchers up there that, you know, some of these farmers uh, farm 300,000 acres and uh, they, they'd been farming Brahmin for decades up there in that, in that extreme climate because that's what that animal's been selected for and selectively bred for. And these animals are having to walk 10 kilometers to water uh, deal with very dry, prolonged periods, and then basically deal with very wet, flooding, tsunami, humid periods, and you know a hard life. And something that I didn't know until I went up to that information day was hearing these testimonies from these farmers that had, you know, some of them had hundreds and some of them had thousands of Brahmin cows, was that they had selectively bred for drought resistance, water efficiency. Um, walking ability, like my short horn cows are not walking 20 k's round trip every day for water. There's, there's no way that they're going to be able to um, thrive in that environment. So that's something that's selected for. They're selected for these resiliencies uh, as a as an industry so um, single mindedly that now you've got a, a cow that almost across the board cannot ovulate while it lactates, which has halved the breedability of these cows. So generally what happens is your cow has a calf. It'll raise that calf um, and, and by lactating and, and breastfeeding it. And normally when that, like on an annual calendar, roughly speaking, everyone's got their own spin on it. But when that calf's around four months old, you'll introduce the bull back into the herd and re, rebreed those cows. And then, you know, so you can imagine the, the calf's been born four months later it gets bred and it's got roughly an eight month gestation and then bang it's dropped off in an annual calendar again what it's meant with the brahmin for a lot of farmers is that an annual breeding's blown out to a biannual breeding and the economics of that is shocking now you know to caveat of course there's exceptions there's some farmers that have selectively bred their brahmin differently and that's not the outcome but i you know that's just such an example of what we're talking about before unintended consequences. So in our welfare state of mind, we're, we're, we're breeding an animal that can uh, handle long walks and low water access, and we've essentially destroyed its fertility. You know, that, that, that's a really, for me, that's a really um, poor, poorly compelling business case to adopt that breed. Mm. Uh, but then interestingly, the farmers that I was discussing, they introduced Nguni bulls 
and bred those but those Brahmin with those issues and for all intents and purposes fixed that fertility issue in first cross animals. Wow. And it speaks to the vigorous fertility, which we haven't really got into, but that's probably uh, one of, uh, I guess, the crown hallmarks of the Nguni animals is their immense fertility. Mm. And to compare that against an animal that isn't a Brahmin, to, let's compare it against a, a Hereford or an Angus, which people might be more familiar with. I, I spoke to a farmer some years ago, I actually processed beef for him in my butchery, and his family had a or has a Hereford stud, so they they breed a lot of Hereford purebred cows, and they act as a genetic base for other breeders. So they do all the data of, of facilitating all the testing, and then they send out top notch bulls and cows to other farms to use. Yeah. And there was a time period where they're maiden heifers, so a, a cow's not a cow until it's had two calves. Get this. Tell your wife at home, you're not a woman until you've had your second child. The first child's not enough. So you've got maiden heifers, heifers, cow. He said that their their pull rate, so when the calf gets stuck in the maiden heifer, the, the, the cow's first calf, the calf got stuck during birth. Their pull rate for a couple seasons there was 40%. Wow. So that's an example of us getting involved and selecting for marbling, uh, higher weaning weights, which would, you know, possibly translate into a higher birth weight, which meant that this cow can't handle the birth of her, her progeny. Yeah. Like what a what a basic need for it for a mother to have. Yeah. Uh, and they had forty percent pull rates, uh, and that was that was also in the context of when that heifer was a young calf, not running with a bull, and the the, the farmers would be monitoring that animal's size and weight. And then joining the bull with the cow, the heifer, when she's about 16 months old and not actually calving down until that, the first calf until that heifer's 24 months old. So a two-year-old animal having its first calf. Yeah. Contrasted to just about every Nguni farmer um, I've spoken to has got examples of the odd heifer having a calf naturally unassisted healthily at 16 months old. Yeah, uh, and they're sort of outliers, but regularly having calves at eighteen or twenty months old with no assistance, and yeah. the animals not because in the in nature, bulls aren't kept excluded from mating heifers. The the animal this is with all all species, the animal has its first ovulation, and game's on. The males can smell it, and they want a piece of it. You know, this is <laughs> this is the natural cycle of things. And to me, that's such a strange mindset that we you know. We can't breed a dog until it's second heat or we can't breed a cow until it's 12th heat and all these different uh, paradigms that we're stuck in. No doubt there's reasons for that because the animals that we have now can't handle those first matings. Yeah. But for me, th there's really valuable economics and a compelling welfare argument to have animals that are, are, are vigorous and healthy enough that they can handle that first ovulation uh, breeding. And to come to do a bit of a full loop and segue back to your taste comments before max that that deepness and that richness uh, of tasting the nguni meat that you're tasting i would like to propose that your body is enjoying and thriving on the vitality of the animal that you're consuming the amount of consumers that tell me i haven't been able to digest pork for 30 years and i haven't eaten pork for 30 years but then they eat my pork and all of a sudden, there's no indigestion, there's no diarrhea, there's no stomach cramps. For me, that's a throwback to um, a healthy animal in a healthy environment. They've, they've, they've been used to eating, I call it slave pork, but pork raised in sheds for yeah. the last few decades. And now they've finally had a heritage breed animal fit for purpose in an environment that it appreciates and the environment appreciates it. And they've got food that their body can uh, thrive on. And so there's so many things that contribute to quality of meat. and these Brahmin that we're farming up north, a lot of that meat's for export because the Australian uh, palate allegedly doesn't like it. I don't know. I've, I've never knowingly eaten Brahmin, so I can't make a comment to that. But the I think if we put our effort into healthy animals, diverse pastures, kind stock handling, and then butchers that actually know what they're doing and, and treat their animals that they're butchering with uh, time and respect because butchering is not a fast exercise. You don't just want to uh, slaughter an animal and then cut it up into pieces two hours later and deliver it to consumers. Th these animals need to hang and test their eyes and age and mature and they need to be treated with respect because they've given us their lives. 
uh, I think there's so many pieces of the puzzle to having amazing quality meat that breeds one of them. You know, meat quality has not been the deciding factor for me to get into Nguni, even though I believe the meat quality is uh, exceptional. But there's many ways to skin a cat is, I guess, the, is where I'm getting to with that. Yeah, and um, I mean, the point is so well taken. And I think that when we have the more human intervention we have in the food supply, in my opinion, the worse the health outcome. And when you see fields of monocropped corn, soy, wheat, um, requiring you know ever increasing amounts of industrial inputs like synthetic fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, um, and then you are, you, you're harvesting them on, on massive scale and storing them where they're perhaps having mold contamination, or, or the more human intervention in, into the process, the less healthy and the less compatible that end product food is going to be for human health. So as you as you mentioned with the with the beef, it, the, I feel like it's almost a corollary of stepping away from input in the raising of the of the cow or the the animal or the or the pig is that you're getting a more healthy product. And we we know how healthy game meat is for humans. I mean, game meat is um, amongst the m- most healthy uh, meat for a range of reasons to do with. Uh, the fatty acid profile and and, and and all kinds of other things. So uh, I love it how we're marrying this idea of a robust uh, kind of intervention-free breed with what I believe is you know optimal human food. And we get we've got a product or or a cow and a, that is so fit for purpose on so many different levels. Um, the point about fertility I just wanted to touch on before we sp- talk specifically about the way that you're approaching Nguni and, and breeding Nguni is how many years can these cows have calves for? I mean, it's something, what, is it 18 years, rem- something remarkable? Yeah, that there's there's uh, data or, or I guess, I, I like the saying that data is the plural of anecdote. You know, a lot of this stuff isn't documented fantastically, but when I did that, enormous 24 hours of research before I started, before I bought my first uh, Nguni bull, I spoke to uh, three or four breeders who'd been in the game for decades each, and uh, I think one of them had pulled one calf once. Wow. And that was, the, the mother had uh, twins in her womb, and they twins often get tangled up on the way out, and it's a real uh, headache. Uh, but, you know, so they're, they're, they're all these little anecdotes about easy calving that, to me, just paints a, a, a data-rich um, yeah. picture. I'm sorry, I can't remember what you just asked me. Max. And, and the got, duration, got, the duration of the fertility. Oh, I, got, I got excited about my own segue. <laughs> yeah, so the the like the economics of a, 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 a cow that's fertile for a long time is exceptional because you're not having to increasingly put in cow replacements. And, and you can send a heifer or a steer off to slaughter at 16, 18 months but you mightn't be getting a uh, – you might have to hold them quite a bit longer than that before you get a calf, and then that calf's got 16 months before you get a return on it, so it really screws up the economics. So yeah. I've spoken to breeders that have been getting a an annual calf out of an Nguni cow for 14, 16 years, wow. and, and, and they're not extreme outliers. I My two Nguni cows that I purchased from Henham Nguni, uh, six, uh, uh, sorry, they're seven and eight years respectively and they're both currently pregnant with their um sixth and seventh calves so they're they're annually so that the year that they miss a calf the way my breeding program and the in the farms that i work with the way our programs go is they're out of the herd yeah Uh, they're they're showing that their fertility is slipping or they weren't able to handle uh, ovulating in the conditions that that year offered which is not acceptable uh because that's the reality of the context of these animals. So, you know, it's, it's very often, it's very frequent to be uh, culling cows out of a herd at three, four, five, six years because they're no longer fertile and they're skipped uh, gestation for that season. But, yeah. it, you know, there's a lot of ingoonies out there, 8, 12, 16 years. And I've heard of bulls working, breeding herds, 17, 18 years old, which is just out of control. There's... Um... I mean, it sounds like some of these chiefs and these African tribes you hear about, you know, in uh, the turn of the century when the, cl- the colonial British showed up and uh, still, what, 70, 80 years old and 
keeping the peace between you know four wives. It's uh, yeah. it's uh, with, it's their, got, with their forty children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, amazing. So I think we've painted a really good picture about why Nguni is such an amazing breed. And Matt, could I could I quickly touch on to finish one of your questions earlier? Sure. Feel the reasons why the industry don't like them because people go, might be please. listening and going, "There's such a good story about Nguni. Why doesn't industry like them?" Yeah. So for everyone listening, first of all. Uh, Definitely in Australia and definitely in America, I can't really talk about Europe and other places, but there is an absolute preference for black animals, okay. uh, namely Angus animals. So, and what this means, the the way this preference is is um, exhibited is when you finish your, when you raise your twenty wheeling yearling weaner steers for the year or your hundred steers, whatever it is, and you send them off to the local sale yards to be picked up by another farmer or to be picked up by an abattoir, whatever it is. It's it's you're basically penalised if your animals are not black, and there's a little bit of uh, like from what I can gather, there's a little bit of reason for this, and the the Angus associations around the world have done such a good job at collecting uh, data across animals across the breed that there's just this mindset that if you're using an, an Angus animal on your farm, you've got more data to make better decisions, and therefore it's probably a better quality animal so yeah. you know th- there's a little bit of thinking behind that but th- what that translates in is no longer uh, the, the 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 real world translation of that is not a not a bonus for an angus animal but a fine for any animal like a, d- a detracting market price for any animal that's not an angus and when you're dealing with an inguni and you've got spots and stripes and 80 different variations of color and patterns there's a real liability there in the marketplace i look at that and my uh, business-minded brain goes ding, 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 asset. Because remember, everyone, a, a liability is just an asset waiting for somebody to awaken it up. And and having 80 different hide options to tan and sell into your market. Imagine being an Angus farmer wanting to start a hide business. Yeah. You've, you've got to be emailing everybody your catalog and inside <laughs> of it. Is one you've got one skew and it's a black hide, but Jake Wolke, who's going to be growing in Goonie, he's got eighty different options, and all of them are, 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 are that's eighty templates within yeah. them. There's all these different um, subtleties, and so there's a real. Uh, and then we touch on the point about the high quality nature of the hides. So it is a real um, example of why the market doesn't like them, but why I do. Another mm. thing's frame size. They're small animals, so a mature in Goonie cow might be something like four hundred to 500 kilos maximum. We're probably talking about a 450 kilo animal. My short horn cows on the farm at the moment, some of them are hitting 700 kilos. And some of these Brahmin we were discussing up north, they're six to 700 kilo animals. And the reality is, is that once an animal's finished uh, growing, they're eating for maintenance. And so if you can have a 450 kilo cow um, eating a percentage of its body weight for maintenance versus a 700 kilo cow eating a percentage of its and let, let's pretend that those percentages are the same they're not because the inguni are very efficient consumers so they're actually consuming a lower percentage of feed for body bodily maintenance but even if they were the same percentage i can actually run more cow units compared to a larger animal so i can have uh more animals, which spreads my risk if I'm having issues with animals getting bitten by a snake or, you know, whatever the, these environmental concerns could be. I've actually spread my risk across more units. And then I've got the opportunity to uh, generate more offspring and I can selectively pick out of a larger pool of animals what I want to retain in my program. You're sort of painting a picture here that, that more could be better in this scenario. Uh, and then do it looking into the actual inguni that I've got versus the short horn that I've got. You've got an animal, the inguni is consuming 2.5% of body weight a day for maintenance and the short horn's closer to 4%. So I can run three inguni cows to two short horn cows for a similar amount of feed consumed on my farm and the weaned weight of calves from those two short horns versus those three ingunis, I'm actually going to have more kilograms of calves weaned with my small framed in three Nguni cows than I would from my large frame two short horn cows. And when you're selling kilograms of beef, I'm not selling heads to the sale yards. I want to be a price maker, not a price taker. When you're selling kilograms of beef, it's just really compelling. Yeah, no, it, 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 that completely makes sense. And I guess for the listener, I really want to emphasize the point that what Jake's doing is really 
playing a different game. There's this conventional game that's focused on the traditional heritage breeds um, that are highly involve high amounts of human intervention and maintenance and very relatively narrow gene pools that have all this established kind of protocols around it. Um, but I, I really love what Jake's doing, which is value adding so much, using a smaller cow, being able to, to carry more on the property, value adding through direct to consumer, through hide sales. I mean, it's it's a completely different game you're playing. And, and I think it's such a, such a great way of, of doing it and really um, giving the consumer and giving us as customers uh, an, an amazing product at, at the same time. So um, did, before we move on, I really, well, we can, I get you to, to explain exactly how what you are expanding your herd as quickly as possible. Because again, that's a pretty unconventional approach that most farmers and, and ranchers will be scratching their heads at until you explain it. So there's not many purebred animals in the country and I want the genetics that Nguni offer. So to give people, to give listeners an idea, these eight year old Nguni cows that I purchased, I paid about $8,000 each for, and you can buy a beautiful, um, well-bred data backed maiden heifer Angus for, you know, three grand. So I've, everyone's looking at this going, Jake's bought these old flogged out cows and he's, he's paid, you know, they should be sold at the sale yards for a thousand dollars and turned into dog food is sort of the attitude. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're in a different mindset here. So that's not what we're accepting. Yeah. But to get genetics going quickly, I, I can't go out there and buy more Nguni cows because they're just not there. Um, and, and even if they were there, I wouldn't be able to afford them. So what I'm doing is I'm crossing them over animals that I can source and I can afford. So I already had these 30 short horn cows. So what I've done is I've, I've purchased my Nguni bulls and I've put them on top of the short horn cows. And they're carving down right now. I've got I've got a few of them on the floor and, and on the ground, and they're doing they're doing fantastic. And that's a first cross. Now, what happens is if I retain the heifers, the females out of those thirty, let's say I get fifteen heifers, and then I get another Nguni bull and breed it over those first crosses. So I've gone my second purebred bull. The, they're a second cross, and instead of being fifty fifty, they're now seventy five percent purebred. Uh, and Goonie was well, 75% in Goonie, 25% short horn. And basically, rule of thumb in the industry is if you do that uh, breeding process for five generations, it's generally accepted that you're back to purebred. And that's something that I learned from breeding dogs. I've been breeding dogs for about six years. And, and they've, they've done some marvelous things. Like there was this example, I, I believe it was the Dalmatian has these uh, urinary uh, crystals in, in its urinary tract that really hurt the dog when it's urinating. And it's basically across the whole breed of Dalmatian all around the world. I believe someone in America crossbred it with a King Charles Cavalier, which you can imagine that dog would look nothing like a Dalmatian, but the the, the urinary health and the pancreas and whatever it might have been in the King Charles Cavalier was so robust that it nuked that uh, liability out of the Dalmatian. And then they've taken male Dalmatians and bred them over those cross progenies for five generation. And at the end of the process, they've ended up with a dog that looks like a Dalmatian works like a Dalmatian, you know, sounds like a Dalmatian and doesn't have urinary tract issues anymore. Wow. And I just think that that's such an um, amazing example of using genetics. And, and the real shame for me in that situation was that the, the pedigree association that you do all your paperwork from refuses to accept that new Dalmatian as a purebred animal, even yeah. though it's far genetically superior to any of the other Dalmatians because it doesn't have this urine issue anymore. Like that really gets my... Um, that's not welfare, folks. No, is it? That's no. like that. That that's penalising health outcomes for animals. Like that, yeah, really. Yeah, v- uh, gets vet, up my nerves. The vet association uh, uh, influence, maybe. Yeah, it's <laughs> just. It, I don't know. Don't even get me started. That's one that'll get me cancelled if I go down that one too hard. But another thing that we're doing on the farm because I've got thirty short horns, which isn't many cows, and if I want to go buy more short short horns or Herefords, I'm still paying three thousand dollars an animal at least yeah. just to get going. Yeah. So I've been working with a local uh, Jersey dairy. So Jersey is obviously a type of breeding, a type of milking cow. Yeah. You've got your your Frisian Holsteins, which are a really tall black and white spotty ones, and then you've got your Jersey, which are your smaller frame tan coloured ones. Yeah. And I'm buying retired. Jersey cows from dairies. They call them choppers in our industry. I don't know if it's because they 
chop them out of the herd and get rid of them, or if it's because they sent them to the abattoir and chop them up for dog food and hungry Jack's burgers. So they call them <laughs> choppers, which I don't think is very flatter. It's flattered. So I like to call them retired cows. Yeah. Uh, and I purchase these re- retired cows for very low cost. So I get them from anywhere from like 900 to $1,100, and they're a fully functioning, uh, talking, uh, sorry, walking, mooing, uh, eating, grazing, beautiful cow. The jerseys have beautiful natures. They're small framed, easy carving, obviously high quality and high milk production. Yeah. And their meat, meat quality is absolutely fantastic. I'm, a, I'm an extreme advocate for jersey meat. Yeah, I love jersey I'm, beef. I'm it tastes joining, amazing. It's so good. I had somebody have a go at me on Twitter this morning because uh, my claim about jersey meat being uh, good was incorrect. And I just replied, Demonstrably wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Meat, it's, it's, do it's, eat it. it's got a, it's got a big yellow. Uh, it's got a really yellow fat cap, and it tastes amazing. Very, it's got a trademark yellow fat. I'm not entirely yeah. sure why. I think it might be to do with the fact that it's a uh, most jerseys are B2, uh, sorry A2 uh, milk producers, which is just mm. a different quality of milk. Yeah. Uh, but I'm actually going to send off some jersey meat for uh, uh, data, like nutrition testing, to, yes. to figure out exactly where it benchmarks against these other breeds. I'm going to be doing that with Inguni. We're going yeah. to really start to rely on nutrition profiles of our, our eggs and pork and, and beef on our farm because we, we really believe that food's medicine. And if we can offer a compelling case, as to and actually back up our claims that our meat to cut above. I think that's a really important thing to do. But anyway, we're joining Nguni bulls with Jersey cows. So the, the way the process works is generally these dairies cull animals twice a year. Yeah. They cull animals out of their herd, which means sell them. They don't shoot them in the paddock. They sell them out of their herd twice a year. If they're because, not, if they're not uh, producing. Well, there's a range of reasons. Foot okay. abscess, if it needs constant intervention for a sore foot. Yeah, uh, it, 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 these, these reasons are important, and I'll tell you why. Uh, if they've got cancer, if they've got recurring mastitis, if they've got pink eye, if if they've got rotten teeth, all these sorts of issues, they'll cull them out of their herd. And I learned that early on because I got these animals. I'm like, I'm I'm importing all these liabilities onto my farm. I, I'm not set up to give these animals the, the care and the rehab and the inputs they need to get back on the uh, bandwagon. So yeah. I called the dairy, and there I, I deal with a local dairy in uh, Kiwa Valley called Klein Mia. And they're sensational uh, people there. And they said, okay, Jake, we understand a bit better what what you're doing with the animals. We're going to send you a list of the animals that have just missed this year's uh, gestation. So they haven't got pregnant this season. And because of that, you know, the animals need to get pregnant every year and calve every year to be lactating, milking every year. So they don't fit the economic program at the dairy. Twice a year, I get an opportunity to buy these animals that do not have these other inherent health risks yeah. and liabilities um, overshadowing them. I just get the ones that weren't fertile enough for the dairy. Interesting. I join them with my bulls. They run with my bulls for about 10 weeks, which you know, quite often people will run bulls with their herd for four or six weeks to really shorten up their breeding uh, system. We, we run our bulls in all the time, and I give these jerseys 10 weeks to join with the bulls because they are coming out of the dairies in sometimes lower condition because they've been milking so hard. Yes. And animals don't often regularly ovulate when they're under any sort of, you know, duress or um, nutrition searching. Well, so I give humans, them, you know, humans too. Humans too. Of course, any on. animal, right? Yeah, yeah. So I give them, I give them, some of them might even, you know, be having up to three chance of, three chances of ovulating and copulating with the bull here. Yeah. And then we preg test them. Everyone who's empty at the 10-week preg test gets their tails, the hair on their tail cut so we can identify them. We write their tag down. And those ones get fattened on our farm for another, you know, two, three, four months, whatever it takes to hit target weight. And then we process that meat. So that animal's still not wasted. It gets turned into beautiful quality meat to be sold under our dairy beef label at the butchery. But those jerseys that took calf with the bull, and now carving down, and we're getting a first cross in Goonie jersey, which I'm actually really excited about because I said before the jersey is a similar frame size. Oh, uh, sorry, it's a lot larger frame size, but it's a similar weight. Yes. Uh, easy carving, high quality milk and lots of it, and and high quality meat. Mm. Uh, it, it, you know, you can show people a cut a jersey, and and the and the marbling blows them away. They didn't know that that existed inside that animal, and that to me is just a really compelling um, ecological and uh, financial business plan. I, yeah. I, I think it's going to be a good one. Well, that's an interesting thought I just had, which is 
um, perhaps you've created a dual purpose animal that you could both use as the first cross, both as a meat animal and as a milking animal. Is that, do you think that's possible? Uh, it depend. It it all depend on your milking operation, which yeah. I, I don't really have any desire to get into in Australia because of the onerous compliance and the the, the amount of capital needed. It's a very you can't really get into dairy in Australia without being an input heavy business because of the volume yeah. needed to uh, pay for infrastructure and and compliance and that sort of thing. Yeah. But you know the whole I guess the premise of this uh, breeding decision, this breeding program has to be is eventually to breed back to pure bred and goonie. Yeah, but I'm looking at these Jersey and Goonie crosses, thinking that there could be a really beautiful composite, and, and with the data and the quality that we're going to be um, seeing come out of the program in years to come, there might be this real niche opportunity to be consistently breeding towards and offering third crosses to people or second mm. crosses, because maybe you get enough of the uh, vitality and vigorous nature out of the Nguni and you and you keep enough of the docility and meat quality out of the jerseys that just have this beautiful wolky breed of cow or whatever it might be. So we'll see. I, I, there, there's there's no preconceptions. It's just the the reality will be the reality, and we'll judge it accordingly to our context. Amazing. That sounds so exciting and. Uh, look forward to tasting and seeing what these cows um, uh, come up with. Uh, before we go on, I just wanted to get you get an idea about where you're looking at. I mean, we asked you at the, the last podcast what your vision is for, for the Walkie Farm um, and the Walkie Herd. I feel like that might have been fleshed out a little bit more since we, we, we last talked. What, I mean, why there shouldn't be any reason why you can't rotationally graze, you know, 1000 cows, 2000 cows, you know, on a larger scale. So so tell me what are you thinking? What do you what do you what's your vision at the moment and how big do you think you could get this operation? I am a little bit uh maybe bipolar. I don't know if that's the right analogy on this topic, but you know, a lot of the things that I love about the type of agriculture, regenerative agriculture that we're doing is that we've got low cost infrastructure we can we can scale nice like nice and slowly without putting heaps of money in there. We're um, we're flexible with transportable infrastructure, and at the moment, as I'm going, I'm paying cash for everything. I'm not taking on debt. So when I buy another forty sheep to come into my ewe flock, or when I buy some more inguni cows or everything, it's all nice and organic, and 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 we're growing, and 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 that to me is uh, uh, just feels nice, right? Not taking on all this risk. Yeah. But I've got a I've got a retail business background and, you know, my family's not uh, new to risk and we're not shy to risk. And the more I look at the state of agriculture, you know, in my area, I think in the last six months, I've watched probably five or six direct to consumer small regenerative farms uh, pack up and close operation because it hasn't been viable for them for whatever reason, you know, and and, and that might be um, family circumstance or whatever but there there really is a tipping point where you need a certain amount of scale to uh make some change in in ecosystems and and uh, impact your community with healing foods which is one of our missions so for me really sky's the limit we've just purchased a mobile chicken abattoir and we're in the process of getting uh, registered on our farm so we no longer have to drive our chickens eight hours round trip to process we can do it on farm and they're the sorts of things that we're really wanting to get involved with uh, more like own more of the supply chain and be more reliant on ourselves and not third parties to to do these sorts of tasks for us so you know i, I i've just leased a bit my another 150 acres or so and i've got another few hundred acres offered to me and we are going to be growing our beef herd aggressively. I guess my my short term goal in the next few years is to have 500 breeding cows, all with some level of inguni blood in them. Uh, that that's sort of this this little um, hallmark that I've got in the back of my head that I'm that I'm striving towards. I've never been a person that I guess needs, you know, everyone writes down goals and 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 has these programs to help keep them accountable I've, I've and i'm sure that's valuable i, I write lists and, and i write plans and things but i've never sort of needed those things to motivate myself it's always there's always this underlying current of growth but after recently getting involved with this uh, australian beef initiative and the local uh bitcoin community in australia which the the, the great thing to me about the bitcoin community 
uh, and this might be a little bit sacrilege to the Bitcoiners listening, it's not the Bitcoin. It's that the Bitcoin's been this uh, identifier to bring towards all, to bring together all these like-minded people that value community, financial sovereignty, food sovereignty, uh, quality food. Like the, the, it, it seems to be this this real magnet. All the, the crowd I've fallen in with, all these people that have these shared values, and a lot of them are very motivated about getting behind uh, and helping regenerative agriculture scale. So my current thinking is using my Aubrey-based farm to you know, to its potential, which we're probably not far off maxing out what the home 100 acres can do in yeah. terms of the amount of chickens, pigs and cows and sheep it can handle. And then once that's humming and the brand's got some real demand behind it, you know, we're on track this financial year to do a million dollars uh, in sales. Uh, once that demand is, is you know, really fortified, then looking at uh, getting into some serious broad acre country where yeah. it's cheaper because here it's onerous. Like I can't afford to get in. Even having a farm doing a million dollar sale, there is, a, you know, out of potentially a hundred acres, there is absolutely no financial business case to be paying twelve thousand dollars an acre to buy free no. land here. Yeah. So to go four or five hours out of town and and, and buy a broad acre, a few thousand acres, and really get some meaningful herds and production systems going to shape landscapes and, and produce bulk food to feed our communities. I mean, that's amazing. And I, uh, I think that's such a great and admirable goal to strive towards because if we're going to access or, or give access to this high quality food to everyone, then it's going to be need, needing to be done at scale. And I think the work you're doing, Jake, is just is so, is setting such a great example for the industry and for um, other like minded people who are uh, interested in, in farming. And, and I mean, the, the carrying capacity and the yield that you're getting off your land compared to, uh, a standard producer. I mean, it, it it's incredible. So, um, really looking forward to seeing where where these things go with with the Mguni herd and and expanding the operation. To close out the interview, I just wanted to talk a bit about the Australian Beef Initiative because that we are we, we're announcing or it's been announced recently that Jake, you're holding the first Australian Beef Initiative Summit uh, at the Walkie Farm uh, on February twelfth. Uh, 2023. So you gave us a little bit of an idea about what the Beef Initiative is. Can you explain to the listener what is the Beef Initiative and why should they be interested in it? Sure. So the Beef Initiative is a, uh, a group of people that are really passionate about educating consumers on the, the health benefits for your own um, sovereign health and vitality of beef. Yeah. and how important that is as a staple in your diet. You know, the the, the industry at large, whether it's um, privatised, highly processed foods or governments, have been smashing red meat intake mm. for a generation now, for decades now, as, as being a heart disease risk and rotting in your bowel and giving you bowel cancer. Imagine if they'd spent a fraction of that warning people about the damage of sugar. Yeah. Like we can get into the weeds and um, talk about how poisonous vegetable and seed oils are for you, which is still somewhat controversial to people who aren't in the know. But yeah. everyone knows sugar's bad for you. And there's and there's and there's never any lick to like where's the marketing campaign saying, you know, maybe put a little bit less Coca Cola on your child's in your child's cup at dinner tonight. You know, yeah. they run a campaign saying stop sending your child to school with ham sandwiches, but there's no uh, you know, stop having, stop feeding them twisties and lollipops at lunchtime. Yeah. You know, so the beef initiative's taken it upon ourselves as a as a group of private citizens to educate people. You know, actually, beef isn't this demonic input that's going to destroy your health. It's actually one of the foundation building blocks to real uh, health in your in your life. And then at the same time, when we're grabbing people's interest with that, teaching them about different farming methods and how different qualities of, of, of welfare outcomes and nutrition outcomes can be achieved and environmental outcomes through your farming methods. Yeah. And then the way you wrap all that up, so you've got a consumer now thinking, wow, beef's actually really good for me and I can have a positive environmental impact and I can be a part of um, high-level animal stewardship, but how? Like I'm not going to go to Coles or, um, or a commodity supermarket and buy commodity untraceable, untrackable, possibly feedlot 
protein off the shelf and be contributing to this community. Well, the way, the thing that the Australian Beef Initiative is striving to do is, is wrap all that up in a nice little package and build a network for you to go straight to a local farmer that you can shake hands with, do a farm tour, buy it direct so the farmer gets more of the retail dollar. And the bonus, bonus for you is you've got traceable quality protein for your family. And underpinning all this is an opportunity to use Bitcoin if you want. It's not a, you don't have to be a mad Bitcoiner. You don't have to be a soft Bitcoiner. You can use fiat currency in Australian dollars. I'm sure most farmers out there, if you contacted them direct, they'd probably be willing to trade labor or gold bullion or a service on their tractor for a piece of beef. You know, you know, the, the VADA and the, the trade economy is a beautiful thing. But it's, the Australian Beef Initiative is just wanting to uh, facilitate access to better quality meat for people. So we've got the first event on our farm here in Albury, Wodonga, New South Wales, Australia, like you said, on February 12th, which is a Sunday. And it's like a nine and a half hour day. We're doing a two and a half hour farm tour starting at 7 a.m., which I'm going to lead. And I'm going to uh, preach to everyone that comes about our land healing ministry here at Wolke Farm. And then we've got a, a string of guest speakers. One of the speakers is Texas Slim, who's heading up the American Beef Initiative, the Texas Beef Initiative, and he's actually flying over from America to speak at our event, which I'm, I'm uh, feel extremely blessed for. And then we've got you, Dr. Max, coming on to speak about metabolic health. We've got a couple of the uh, Bitcoiners talking about sovereignty and and uh, Bitcoin. We've got uh, that's John Tiernan and Izzy, and then we've also got uh, Dr. Pran, Logan Nathan's also coming, which I'm excited. This is our big announcement. He's coming to Wolke Farm to talk about the way the industry has been uh, rotting us and and steering us towards really poor health decisions because it's suited their economic conditions. And I think it's just going to be a really fun day. And for people that are quick buying their tickets the night before, so that this is on the Saturday beforehand on the 11th, we're having an intimate little dinner at a local boutique restaurant called Bistro Cell and I'm working with Tara, the head chef there, and we're catering a three-course dinner all with Wolke Farm protein and that's going to be for about 30 people. So that'll be an intimate little gathering and then the big the big shebang on the Sunday, we're hoping for 150 people and it's going to be an absolute riot. Yeah, I mean, Jake, that's um, I'm so excited to be speaking and as you mentioned, I'm going to be speaking about the link between regenerative agriculture and metabolic health. And the fact that we need the highest quality nutrient dense animal foods if we're going to get collectively back to um, a healthy society. So, um, really, really excited to be, to be a part of the event. And I would encourage anyone, even if you're just mildly interested, um, to come along, come to Albury, um, meet Jake, shake his hand, have a look at the, the Walkie Farm, um, come and have a chat to me um, and Dr. Pran, he's going to be there. He's a gastroenterologist from Sydney, an incredibly knowledgeable and um, erudite man who is speaking a lot of truth at the moment um, a ra- at a range of uh, topics, including the interests that are perhaps shaping healthcare um, and medicine away from what is probably the gold standard um, and towards a much more uh, pharmaceutical-based system so there'll be a lot of great speakers we're we're hopefully going to be recording the event so that that will also be on youtube at some point ideally but uh please come along in person and and participate Um, because I, i really think and jake you'd agree with me that everything that we're talking about these ideas about health and the environment and uh global sustainability they all begin with the individual we can't hope to change the world if we haven't first changed ourselves. And that might sound cliched, but essentially it's a, I believe it's a, it's a deep, deep seated truth. And if you want the world to be, if you want the, the world to be eating a, a nutrient dense, sustainable animal protein, then you yourself have to be buying that off a farmer and, and sourcing it in, in, in an ethical and, and sustainable way. So, um, We'll be talking a lot more about um, the Beef Initiative over the next month in, in the run-up to the event, um, and I would encourage anyone to uh, come along, talk to us on social media if you have any questions. We'll be happy to answer them. I'm sure, Jake, your your DMs are open. Um, you can email me. Um, we're, we're very open in terms of answering questions and facilitating people 
to um, get get part of this lifestyle. So, uh, Jake, any final parting thoughts about Nguni or the or the Beef Initiative, or or just parting words you'd like to share with the listener? Look, I, I think the people listen to different presentations like this and they get motivated uh, and, and they get excited as they should because the future is bright. You know, there, there's there's plenty of uh, good stuff happening around the world. We're, we're like, I, I think the future is bright. And they often ask me, uh, how can I help? And a lot of these people are all hyped up and they and they want to all of a sudden get, uh, you know, jump in up to their waist and, and, and do a lot, which is appreciated. And a lot of the time I find that sort of fizzles out that, the biggest thing you can do to help these sorts of uh, drive these sorts of systems and the outcomes that we're striving towards is exactly like you said, Max, sorting yourself out first. And, and, and that's just by supporting, you know, sort, sort your own diet out, your own health out. And, and what that's going to knock on effect is that you're supporting these local farmers at the cash register, which helps them, pay the staff, expand the operation if that shows their desire. So it, we, we all just need to be putting our money where our mouth is and that and that means buying quality foods and, and, and getting behind people that are leading the charge in a way that we want to see it done. So buy good meat. Fantastic. Well, uh, Jake, thanks so much for your time and I uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, Max. Appreciate it. Cheers. 